So, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm here today to talk with you about uh, core values of software freedom. And uh, before we start with that, I would like to get a better feeling of how you feel about certain topics. So let's get started. I will ask you the question three. First one is, okay, something did not yet work. Sorry. Okay, no. First question, who of you here thinks that gov your government's military should not operate in other countries? Can you show the hands? <laughs> and uh, next question, who here thinks that it should be mandatory to be vaccinated? Okay, and the last question, uh, it's a religious question, and most people say you shouldn't do that in a talk, I still want to do it, so who of you thinks that Emacs is the best operating system or editor? Okay, good, thank you very much for that. We will come back to some of those questions in the talk. So, when we are talking about the core values of software freedom, it's good to have a look at where this movement is coming from. And so we are going back to the time when your computer didn't fit in your pocket, but you needed some room for that. And at that time, the software which was coming with the computers was in source code form and you were able to make modifications to that. There was no restriction what you can do with that. You, you got it, you could ch make changes. In most cases, you even had to do changes to make anything meaningful with it. And you could pass it on to other colleagues in your department uh, or pass it on to other researchers. And that was all possible. There was no restriction. Then over the time, some companies figured out that you can make way more money if you restrict how software uh, is handled. And they introduced in the, in the software licenses restrictions on this, what people can and cannot do with the software. And over the time, those restrictions, they get more and more bothersome to people. And at one point, uh, people decided to make a change and fight against this. And they said, that they would like to, to build an operating system, the GNU operating system, where every component there is able to, uh, is uh, giving you the, the rights you had before. And for this, they had to write down what, what are those fundamental rights you had before, those freedoms. And they came up with, in the end, four points that everybody should allow to use the software for any purpose, that you should be allowed to study how the software works, that you should be allowed to share it with others and in the end also improve it and make, adopt, uh, um, make changes to the software. So that's what they wrote down in the free software definition by the GNU project and the, the FSF. And from there on started trying to rebuild the whole, uh, a, a whole operating system where each of those components gives you those rights. Later, there were other organizations who defined that in a longer list, like here with uh, Debian or the Open Source Initiative, they defined that with 10 points. I will not go into the details of those 10 points, I will come back to some of those. I'm never able to remember all those 10 points, I can remember the four points, so I will stick with those at the moment in the talk. But they defined the same thing there. And just to clarify before, when I'm talking here, uh, about the values of software freedom. And when I say free software, I mean the same thing as when people from the open source initiative say open source, uh, or when someone else says FLOSS or FOSS, that's the same thing for me. It's uh, similar to, what is this? Tell me, a car, anything else? A mini, some people say it's a BMW when it's about a brand. 
Some people say it's a computer on four wheels or several hundred computers on four wheels. And some say it's a vehicle. Depending on what you say, you highlight different aspects. Uh, you will be perceived differently. Uh, it's a little bit of different meaning uh, what you transport. But in the end, people will understand that it's about this thing there. And that's the same for, for those other terms. So when I'm talking here about free software, I mean the same thing as when others say open source or FOSS or FLOSS or Libre software, just to, to clarify that before. So now, over the time, these, uh, what, what is this movement about was, uh, was often questioned or there were misunderstandings about that. So one of the first things which which came up was, does it mean in, in software freedom that you also have this value of uh, creative software, that it should be available for everyone without the need of having money to pay for it? And that's something which came up already very early, and there were several clarifications about that. But still, over, over the time, it came up repeatedly, and also because of the um, often uh, in, in the English word free software, the misunderstanding that it's, it's about uh, the greatest uh, part, this come up regularly. And we, we also see it uh, that people, they, they contact us constantly. They, they tell us, there is a piece of software out there, they claim it's free software, but you have to pay for it when you want to download it. So they are violating our principles, they are vi violating our values, that cannot be free software when, when they charge for it. Or they, they also tell you in app stores that, uh, that it's not possible that this is free software when you, when you have to pay for it. And that's one of the things which in the, in the free software movement, which had to be repeated repeatedly, <laughs> that it's absolutely fine to charge for software. That's not included in there. It's not about that you have to pass on something without having to pay for it. The FSFE, on the contrary, we encourage people to pay for free software and that you pay for software where the developers give you more freedom and don't restrict you on what you can do. Give more money to those people than to those who restrict what you can afterwards do with it. So charging money for free software is absolutely fine. There's nothing in there. And it's also something which repeatedly in the discussions, there was a common misunderstanding in the free software community that it's okay to do so. Furthermore, a lot of people during the time believed that free software is equal to the perception that uh, people should all together develop the software and everybody should be allowed to participate in developing the software. This uh, understanding came a bit from the uh, from very very famous projects which uh, had this approach so everybody was able to participate there and that's why a lot of people uh, during the years, they, they think that something cannot be free software or is violating the, the principles if people don't let them participate in their project or if people don't want uh, to give them the source code at the moment when they don't have any relationship with each other. And then they, they, they say that our principles are violated there. And that's something where the the development model and what free software or open source is about, that's not the same thing. You can develop software in your basement, sit there, ignore everybody around you, don't take any phone calls, don't read any emails. When you're on the street and someone tells you your software should have this feature, you just ignore that person. You can do that and then sell the software to someone, give them the source code, or the offer to give the source code, give them the, those four rights, that's absolutely fine to do so. You can do that. That's still free software. On the other hand, if 50 universities around the globe are developing a software and the students are allowed to participate, every professor is allowed to participate, and even the public is allowed to participate, but they write that you are only allowed to use it for academic purposes, it's violating some of the other principles there. It's 
not free software anymore, it's proprietary software because not everybody is allowed to use it for any purpose. But it's still a very open development model and it's possible that hundreds of people are developing this together. On the same side, it's also possible that this is changing over the time. So you have some people out there developing free software, some groups, and for some time they are listening in a lot to everybody around them and participate uh, in, their dis in the discussions with, uh, with their community. But then they have uh, a client who wants to have a certain feature or a certain product where the software is integrated, and then you need to make the deadlines. And it's possible that during that time you don't read the mailing lists or forums or don't uh, check your IRC channels uh, as you did before and ignore other people around you till you made this product. And it's possible that afterwards you see, oh, that works also for me better, and you stay with that, or after some time you go back. That, that's all possible with free software. So the development model and the, the uh, if it's free software or proprietary software, that's not directly related to each other. Beside those misunderstandings which occurred over the time and where the, the uh, free software movement had discussions about that, if things are good or bad about this and what's, what's right or wrong, there were also then people who said that I, I like that you are able to use, study, share and improve the software. There's just one small thing that is missing for me that this uh, also covers my ethical beliefs. One of the very common examples, uh, one of the very famous examples here over the years was that people said the military should not be allowed to use the software. Because when I develop something, I don't want afterwards people to use that software to kill others. That's against my beliefs. I don't want that to happen. And they thought about introducing something in the licenses where those uh, freedoms I, I mentioned before to use, study, share and improve software where they are written down in software and wanted to introduce clauses like this to prevent military use. Now, over the years, this debate was repeated. And one of the first things which uh, is often questioned when introducing something like this is, you imagine someone who wants to kill others and uh, thereby heavily um, do f bad things to other people, do you believe that they will check what is written in some license and will adhere to what is written there just because like Cornelius is writing down, please don't use, uh, don't use my software for, for military. Um, they will say, oh no, no, I, it would be so handy to use that software now to kill those people and, uh, and achieve my goals, but uh, he, he wrote that down, so let's do that, let's find 20 programmers to, to, make, uh, to write this piece which he developed over the last 20 years and, uh, and do, it, do it differently. So, I mean, that, that's a, a question which came up there, how much effect does it really have to include something like this? The, the other question which came up is, what does military use mean? Do you think, should, should uh, the software be allowed to be used in, in, this, in this car, vehicle, computer on wheels? Should it be allowed? I mean, in, in many uh, parts around the world, you attach a machine gun on this, and that's the tank of the 21st century. So it's very difficult to, uh, to make a decision there. Is, are they then allowed to do that? And what about a company who is producing this? Are they then allowed to, to use the software because they are producing the equipment for the military? It's, it's a very, very tough decision there. Um, so how, how to define what is military use? And if you, um, depending on where you are coming from, where you grow up, you also have a very different understanding of what the military actually is. Because around the world, it differs what the responsibilities are. So in some countries, the main responsibility of the military is to use tanks, machine guns, uh, other weapons, and defend the country or attack a country. But there are other countries where the military is responsible to uh, take care about fires. Like you have large forest fires, and 
they do this there. Or uh, in cases of floods and other catastrophes, they are in charge of handling this and helping the uh, um, helping the population to to deal with that. In some ca uh, some countries, it's even there. There is not that much uh, um, emergency uh, for for. Um, uh, when you are injured, it's, it's then also the military which gets you down from the mountains and rescues you. So the question is then, if you prevent military usage, or in general if you prevent certain usage, what other usages are you thereby preventing? Because you have some certain background and some certain thinking what, uh, what you believe this area is covering, which might be completely different in another part of the world. One of the other topics that also came up uh, was that uh, someone wrote a license which said that you should not be allowed to use the software if you are not vaccinated. And as a company, you are not allowed to use the software if you don't make sure that your employees are vaccinated. Because, I mean, person either wanted to test some things about free software licensing or uh, wanted to uh, had a belief about uh, public health and what to do there and then wanted to introduce this or have others stick to their value system there and there was often a question i mean how much control should a programmer have over others how much of your own belief system should you be allowed to transfer on others what is right and what is wrong there. Most of the times, uh, or till now, the free software movement always came back, that's too much. We should not allow a programmer to have so much power over users or other developers. And I mean, those are not just two examples. There are many, many more. So there are uh, people have, have written licenses or made suggestions that uh, it should be free software, but you should not allow to use it in nuclear power plants. It should be free software, but it should not be allowed to use for people who um, who do animal testing or uh, genetic engineered uh, food or in general genetic engineering or uh, about certain aspects of labor law that companies should not be allowed to use it if they have a certain amount of working hours and no breaks and uh, some of them they were even that general that they said don't use it for evil purposes which is even more complicated than to think about uh, what is that depending i mean i i would be quite sure that if we go through several topics here some of you would say it's evil some of you would say it could be fine in certain circumstances and a lot of the examples here even if we here would agree that most of them would be good if they would not be done with the software we develop think about the most evil person you know or you ever encountered and think about what might they include in their licenses. What people they might include, what use cases they might exclude, and what they want to force you when you are using the software. So, as much as it is under, as I can understand that people want their, uh, their beliefs to be transported in, in their work, it's, it's difficult to do that with software licensing. And uh, it's something where a lot of people in the free software communities, they saw over the time, oh, uh, as, as those values are embedded in the, in the software licenses, the use, study, share, and improve, uh, it's, it's embedded in there. And they, they have to believe that it's also due to the licenses that this is the case, because you saw that you ach achieved certain things with this. For many, this tool of free software licensing <laughs> It's a bit the hammer and then a lot of problems, uh, the rest of the problems out there, they look like nails and you, uh, you try to fix it with that. And that's often from the past not probably the right approach there to, to try to fix everything with, with this uh, one tool. But you should consider if those other beliefs, if you can also uh, achieve that with changing laws, with changing social norms, influencing the markets, or um, changing the architecture and other measures how you can regulate society. In the end, after all those discussions and, uh, and debates over 35 years of the free software movement, 
in the end, it always came back that, yeah, it's, it's really difficult uh, to add other things there. And at the core, it's, it's those, mainly those uh, four points or those 10 points, which we defined early on in the process and which we wrote down and codified by that. So to go a bit deeper into them again, so the, it always came back to the belief that anyone should be allowed to use the software for any purpose without getting permission. So there should be no discrimination who should be allowed to use the software and who should not be allowed to use the software. It's not the programmer's decision. It's everybody is allowed to do that. And also without any restrictions and no negotiation there. So you should not be, have to go to the programmer first and ask, am I allowed to do this? Am I allowed to do that? That's one of the, the main features with, with free software. All of you in here, who, who of you is a lawyer? Any lawyer in here? Okay. Uh, I, I can tell you, even if none of you is a lawyer, when someone out there is asking you, can I do this with the software? You can say yes. And you can be so sure that you can say, yes, I'm, I'm really sure you, can, you are allowed to do this. And am I also allowed to do it? Yes, you too are allowed to do it. But can I do, it, can I do this with it? You can say yes. Yes, yes, without having to study the, the license, without needing to read the license at all, you always know that when something is free software and it's, uh, there's, it's clear that it's free software, you can do that. You, you don't have to, to do the, any checks there. So even people who cannot read, they know they can do anything with it. And furthermore, it's always allowed to understand what the software is doing, to study the source code of the software. So nobody is restricted what they can learn, how software works around them. So the free software movement, they don't limit, we don't limit what people can understand about technology there. You're always allowed to understand that, to learn from it, and to discuss what you found out how software works with the rest of society and have a debate, is this right or wrong in your opinion? That's something which is always allowed with free software. And furthermore, you're always allowed to share it with others again. So there is no, um, no restriction with how many people you can share. You can share it publicly without getting any money um, because you want to help people. You can also decide, well, I would like to, to make a lot of money and you, you sell the software to others. And you can, I mean, you can do that for your own benefit or to, to help others. And you never need any permission for that. It's not necessary that you ask someone if you are allowed to share it with others again. You can take a software where you paid a lot of money and you, you know someone who doesn't have a lot of money and you can just pass it on without asking for any money for it. That's always possible. So people should not be restricted how they can help others or what they can do with, with, the, with the software there. And furthermore, in a world where more and more software, where more and more devices around us and more and more processes around us are dominated by, by software, people should not be forced, neither individuals nor organizations nor companies uh, nor governments should be forced to use the software in a way the developer decided them to do and change their processes accordingly. But you should always be allowed to make modifications and make the software help you in what you want to achieve or ask others to help you with this. So you can always adopt the software. You're always allowed to extend it further. Um, if you don't agree with the general parts of the software, you can make your own modifications and go a completely different way from there on. And you can make, uh, you, you can also thereby repair things out there. So, and, and that's, that's always was something over all those 35 years always came back to it that this is the common base we can agree on. And, uh, so, I mean, it's, it's an often there's the, the question of, okay, but, free software doesn't solve this problem or free software doesn't solve this other problem. And that's why it's important for us to remember that free software and software freedom, what, what we have here, it's one tool for one piece of the puzzle. 
So there are many problems out there which, where you need other things as well to fix it. There might be, I mean, if we stay in technology, we can talk about open hardware, we can talk about open data, we can talk about privacy, we can, and so on, about all different aspects and a lot of aspects there, they are important to achieve certain goals in society and to have certain outcomes. So free software and a lot of problems people see, it's a, it's a necessity, but it's not enough to fix the problem. And instead of, instead of uh, thinking about, okay, what else do we have to add to free software or to software freedom, we just think about the old Unix philosophy, have one tool for one problem, and don't overload it with all kinds of other things. So that's, I think that's often good to remember that we have this, we have software freedom, it's fixing a few things and it's fixing those good, but we should consider for other parts which we see in society, other problems we see, if we have to combine it with other tools out there in the way we think it's, it's fitting. So there is still a very long way ahead of us if we want to make sure that software freedom is the default out there. There are many, many areas where software freedom is meanwhile the default, but there are many areas where it's not the case. And some areas where it was the case before, they might at certain points change a little bit and then you again have uh, things where it was uh, common that you could use free software for it and then it's, it's not common anymore and you you have the problem that you are confronted with proprietary software again. And for this, it's, I think it's good to always remind ourselves about uh, how such changes in society are happening also in other areas. Like if we compare it, uh, software freedom with the freedom of the press, we, people were working for that for hundreds of years and they were, they were, uh, yeah, many, uh, several people, they, they had very uh, bad effects. Uh, they had to suffer because they were working for that. And some, uh, many people, they, they died for it. And when you once have it in society, it also doesn't stop there. You have to constantly defend those, those uh, rights, uh, the freedom of the press. And so there, there are often changes there. And even if, I mean, if you go out uh, now in the, in the world and ask people, is freedom of the press important? You have a large Maybe, yeah, you have, you have many people here in Europe, many people who say, yes, that's important. How much they stand up for that is another question. And if you take the rest of the world, it's a question how many people there will say it's important and that they would do something about it. So, and, and that's something where people were working for hundreds of years already. Now, if you compare that to software freedom, where we're working for 35 years, it, it's good to put that in a, in a perspective there. So there will be many, many more decades to come. And because of that, it's important to focus there, that you don't get distracted from many, many other problems in our society, in, in this movement, and think that we should also try to fix this and this and this. And in the end, I believe that if, if you try to do something like this and try to fix everything at once, you will in the end not achieve any of those goals. So that's why I think it's important that as a software a freedom movement to focus, to focus on those values which we, which we defined at the beginning and which also we, we came back to. To, to compare that with, uh, yeah, with one own activity of myself, I also have some other values besides software freedom. And uh, so I'm, a I'm active in a wilderness first aid group and I don't want people to um, have severe injuries or die because of the lack of proper preparation when they do outdoor activities. I think a lot of them can be prevented by good training and uh, I'm part of a group of others who also thinks that this is possible and we want to achieve that. Now, if I start discussing with them about software freedom, <laughs> that's a different topic. <laughs> and some of them, they don't care about that, some think it's not that important, some are really huge fans of some proprietary software out there. And uh, it's sometimes uh, a bit difficult if you have a belief in one area and then you work with people uh, on something you also believe in, but you are sometimes, yeah, you encounter those, those other beliefs where it's, it's not matching with yours. And still I'm doing this because I believe that 
when I want to achieve this one goal of mine, in this case, to prevent injuries or deaths uh, in, in outdoor uh, activities, I can achieve that by working together with the group who also believes in this. And I will work with people like you on the software freedom issues. And that's also, I think that it's, it's difficult in, in such a movement if you try to have too many different things where you have to agree on. If we take the three questions from the beginning and everybody has to agree on those, how many less people would we be in the movement or like now in the room if all of that will be way less and it's important that we have many people there so just just to clarify this this one point when i talk about the values of the movement of the of the software freedom movement i don't mean that this is equal to the values organizations have in this field so there are many organizations who have additional values besides that people should be allowed to use, study, share, and improve software. We as FSFE, we also have other values. They are, some of them are written down in our constitution. Some of them are, um, they were important to the founders of this, or some are uh, through the work of people who contribute there. It's, it's transported, it's not written down. Um, and all of this is in, it's influencing us, and, and, and we have other values there as well. But they are not... We don't have those values because we are a free software organization, but a lot of them rather because we are a European organization from people growing up here in this culture with the certain background, certain education. So that, that's more influencing this than that it's a free software organization. And I, I would encourage people to think about it if um, when, when you have a movement and also groups, how, how many beliefs do people have to agree to to work with you on these issues and how many of the other beliefs can you work with others? And when do you have to split up? How large is your group to, to make a, a change there? And so I, I think it's important that many, many people, it's, it's, ne uh, it's necessary that many people are working together for software freedom around the world. If we want to make software freedom the default, it's not just us here in the room. We need to have many, many people around the world who are following us there. And as the, as the, um, we will grow there. I mean, the free software movement already grow over the last years by many, many people, many more countries, way more diverse from, from backgrounds, uh, from the companies. Uh, different companies who were against us before, then many governments who didn't care about it before. And so it's, it's growing and growing. And that's important that this is happening. But it also means that because of this, there will be more diversity, more than we already have now. So there will be people from countries who have completely different education than we have, a completely different cultural background than we have. So this will also challenge how to be respectful to others. I mean, you see how some of the debates are, are at the moment happening about questions I mentioned before. So that's something where, yeah, it, you will be challenged in your beliefs and how, how to be respectful to others. But it's important that we, that we stay respectful and uh, work together with the others to achieve our common goal. And finally, the other part which is important is that we focus as a free software movement, that we don't try to fix everything at once, but that we focus on what this is about, what it was started for, what, uh, what you can fix with software freedom, and focus on those parts that, you are, that we want to enable people to use software for any purpose, to study how it works, to share it with others, and to finally then also make improvements and adopt it to your own needs. So, yes, that's, that's it from my side at the moment. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to have discussions with you over the day. Thank you. Questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you for the talk. <clears throat> it was great. 
Uh, I have a question. You mentioned there was a point where you had these discussions over and over again about you know not allowing military use of software or other use of software. And was there uh, some turning point uh, recently, or was there ever at some point, or does this, this discussion still come up? Just curious about that. It, the discussion is coming up repeatedly. So, um, I mean. The, the last point I think where, where, it, uh, where there was some in, in Germany now some more discussion was I think two years ago also at the Chaos Communication Congress. Uh, this topic came up. It's often, I mean, when, whenever uh, there is a military conflict somewhere, it comes up or when someone finds out that the software they, they wrote is used by the military or by intelligence services, by the police, by border control, by um, some of other uh, institutions where people don't agree with, then it's coming up again. I mean, you also see it now with uh, border control. Uh, you, you saw it with uh, intelligence services where uh, the software uh, was reused in some, um, in some spyware. So this then comes up regularly and also around the globe. <laughs> in different different contexts and I mean it's, it's also uh, I think it's also good that this discussion comes up because uh, for for many years programmers were not aware about uh, social implications of their work and it's, it's important that you think about what what um, what how, what your responsibility in society is when you are writing software and you are providing tools and what can be done with that. You should not just say, yeah, I don't care what, uh, what people do with my, with my software. And I, I also can understand that people then try to limit this in a, in a software license. Also, I don't agree that this is the best way to actually achieve that you can, you can uh, follow your beliefs in this area. But it's, it's a good thing that, that uh, we have more discussions about what is good use or ethical use of, uh, of, uh, of our technology. So that's, that's something which should be encouraged and also uh, talk about what can you do to prevent this. Can you uh, already write the software in a way that it's very difficult to use it for for bad purposes in, in your view? Or do you agree in your community from the beginning and also codify that maybe um, how you want to, to work with certain groups out there? If you all agree that you don't want uh, the military to use that to, to kill people with drones, maybe it's good that you have some common understanding about it and don't help them when they ask you questions, uh, when they have bug fixes, feature requests, and so on. So that, that it's a good discussion that, we, that this, is, this is happening. Um, <clears throat> Thanks, Matthias. Um, question. Do you perhaps see an area where uh, free software will be challenged in a sense where, you're, where you do a comparison, let's say, to freedom of the press, and then you have, um, uh, say, WikiLeaks, for example, where that's being challenged, and say, the US or something. Is there anything that you kind of see that could happen uh, with free software in legal aspects going forward? And, you know, governments, per se, can't be prosecuted on these things, but they can make the rules. So um, I find that there we haven't reached that point, but I, I'm sure a case will probably come forward that'll challenge uh, free software. I, I mean, free software was challenged many times before. There were challenges that uh, that companies were challenging: is are the um, are those licenses valid? Um, do certain programmers have the right that they can uh, they can ask people when you make modifications to give back uh, the, your your contributions as a company? Like with, with copyleft licensing, we saw it many times that companies were challenging that. There are there are other challenges where uh, people now try also. I mean that these um, uh, copyright is already one. Uh, copyleft is already one tool which is added there to to prevent those values, but it's already very on the on the borderline of uh, how much uh, power a developer should have over other developers and uh, and users, and that was something which uh, till now was by by many found acceptable for some areas, 
but it's it's something which is still a challenge there like how how for, um, how far should that go and there are at the moment uh, um, licenses which are brought up there where people say oh that's too much or some say hmm, maybe so that's something where, where we will be definitely challenged and beside that you you have other challenges technological challenges that things are changing from you have your uh, computer, everything, all the software is running on the computer to the software is running somewhere else or uh, all those devices around us uh, have, have software in there. So that's also com often changing because that was not what, uh, not, not the situation where uh, when these uh, values were defined where, where we are in. And so there is constant, uh, you have to think about how to, how this transfers to, to some changes there. Did that answer your question? Or kind of, kind of sort of, but yeah. it, you know, I, I'm thinking like you have, for example, freedom of the press and a lot mm -hmm. of the constitutions. Where, where where is that going to be with you know when when you do have a legal challenge? Okay, and and, and you're talking about rights. Okay, uh, yeah. Oh, I I, I think now I understand it better. So I I mean all freedoms you have in a society they are not absolute. And you always have to balance them. Like freedom of the press is also balanced by you are not allowed to put something in your paper which is violating other people's right, rights, uh, other rights we have in our society. And with software freedom, it's also something that the uh, software license uh, and, and from the software freedom perspective, you might say you can do anything with it, but the law will say you are not allowed to do this, no matter if you use software for it or not. And uh, they might also restrict, uh, like what what you are allowed to do with certain with certain software. And on the other hand, it's it's also possible in a world uh, how how it's developing at the moment that there are also some restrictions that um, that governments will restrict people who want to make software proprietary because they say it's such an important component in our society. It's important that people can have a debate if, it's, if this software uh, is sending you to jail or not, that we have a debate if the rules implemented in there are right or wrong. So it's also possible that there uh, people cannot decide if something free software or not, but the government will, will say this and there will be, because of the internationality of uh, software development, there will be many, many conflicts uh, ahead of us and debates. You made a very compelling case that licenses are not the right tool to enforce ethical use of software. Now, I don't think we can ignore that it's a problem um, if software is used in a non-ethical way and software is becoming very, very dominant. So what are your thoughts about what would be the right tool to enforce an ethical use of software or create a better environment which uh, makes this more easy? Mm -hmm. So I mean, the, the, the first thing is that for me, software freedom is ethical. And uh, it's, it's, it's another ethic than some other people people's ethics. But uh, it's, it's a very ethical thing. It's actually, it was so ethical and so political uh, when the free software movement started that a few years later, um, there was a marketing term which was invented to take away those ethical beliefs and, and rather sell it, uh, sell it better. So the term open source was mainly coined because it was too ethical for the venture capitalists in the, in the Silicon Valley. So um, th there is a lot of ethics there. <laughs> It's, it's just different than uh, some of the debates we, we, we have at the moment. It, it's difficult to, to answer that question because I think that uh, depending on what problems you are looking at, the solutions are completely different. I think, I mean, there, there, are, there, are, um, so there are problems out there where you need to change laws, where you need to change international laws. Uh, you will, from my perspective, not fix the, the problem of... Uh, of uh, these huge monopolies uh, which, we, which we see out there in the tech world by creating a new license. You, you have to think about how, uh, how to change laws, how to regulate markets, um, or, yeah, I mean, it, it, for, for certain problems people see. So it's also possible that, I mean, there are other people who say it's not a problem at all. <laughs> so that, that, that's, that's the thing, that there are so many people who have so different perceptions about problems that also then the solutions are so different. So, I mean, 
I, 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 for me, it's always always uh, good to to remember those those points which Lawrence Lessig was making about how how people are regulated. You have laws, you have social norms. I mean, by by not accepting something and making sure that a lot of people don't accept certain behavior, it's also a lot of influence. You not always have to change a law. If in a in a community you have certain standards, they are not written down, but. Uh, but they are still uh, it's it's, uh, it's considered impolite to to um, uh, to not adhere to them that's also a very powerful tool it takes a way longer time to change social norms often than to change laws but still in in some smaller groups it's it it, it can happen faster Beside that, yes, markets. I mean, you, you can change markets, and you also for as as I said before, when when you spend more money on buying free software than you spend on buying proprietary software, if a lot of people are doing this, this has an influence. And the last part, which which Lessig always mentioned, is yeah, architecture, code. I mean, when as a programmer you decide to write certain software or not to write certain software which is then influencing what people can do and what you empower them to do, that, that, that has a huge effect. If certain software is out there, uh, okay, I'm now reminded about Freifunk. Uh, if, if you have software where everybody can, can just uh, use that to set up a network, that's making a huge uh, impact on society and you, you have an effect where it's easy for people to do that. If on the other hand, it's, it's a widely distributed software to harm people, you also have an effect. So if the main purpose for the software is to harm people. So and I think those, those four things, it's, it's always you, you have to think about that. You have to find innovative ideas. I think with, with software freedom, we found an innovative idea in one area at that, po at that point of uh, time. And nowadays, as I said, you have problems which are way more complex out there in society. And uh, software is often one piece of that. It's often necess a necessity to solve a problem, but there are many things around that which, uh, which you also need and where uh, I don't want to answer the question, what is the right tool for that or not? There are way more clever people for other areas who, who will have to think about that. Okay, we have time for one more question over here. Um, hi, thanks and for your talk. Um, I agree with everything you say. Um, just because of the discussion which now came kind of up, I wanted to point out that there's something like export control laws, uh, which a lot of people never think yes. about. Um, because while um, open source and the licenses allow you everything to do, it doesn't mean you're allowed to do everything you want to do because there's still other rights. And um, so just for an example, there's some restrictions on like... Um, everything which is military or dual use, um, if you're allowed, to, where you're allowed to share it or to publish it. So um, while the license allows you to share your stuff with everybody, it might be that you're not allowed to put it somewhere just on the internet without any precautions, depending on what you're doing. And um, so I think there are some, and this shows that there are some ways to find agreements on ethical stuff because there's some, um, like regarding mass destruction, also weapons of mass destruction and stuff, that you're not allowed to do something like that. So if somebody were to write open source software about something like that, um, they wouldn't be allowed to publish it brightly on the internet without getting in trouble. Um, so I just say there's there's already stuff in place, maybe for the really critical stuff, but um, yeah, yeah, it it, it depends. So <laughs> I, I would say, I mean, first, yes, the, the, the big difference here is that with free software, it's, uh, the question is, like, should a programmer be allowed to make such rules for the rest of society? I mean, programmers are already in a very powerful position because they are creating all those tools. So should they also be allowed to restrict even further what people can and cannot do through such, such rules? That, that's, that's one question. Or should that happen, like you said, like with governments making laws, like export rules. But um, why I said it depends is that's true for, for Germany. <laughs> that's maybe also true for some other countries in Europe. But I'm pretty sure that there are countries uh, around the world where some of the things you mentioned, nobody will have a problem with that. <laughs> Uh, and it might become a problem if they see that it has a negative effect on them or if they have a problem for 
justifying their power, but that's that's the thing that nowadays with with software freedom, the software freedom movement, it's so large, and there are people from so many peop, uh, countries around the world and people using software, where some of the users of that software are actually institutions which the export law for, prohibits you to give it to them, which many people would say it's a good thing, but it's not something which is regulated by software freedom. And so that, that's, yeah, but very good point. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. That was a great talk. <laughs>